The first talk is by Michael Heller from Potsdam um, near Berlin, and he will talk about gravity, quantum fields, and information. Go, please go. Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming so early. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I would like to thank the organizers, in particular Johanna, for putting this together. Um, I was asked uh, to give an overview talk. So I'll be talking about uh, various bits around uh, intersection of quantum information with holography in high-energy physics and gravity. And I decided to title the talk Gravity, Quantum Fields, and Information, which is the name of the group that we're running in Potsdam uh, at AEI. And the reason why I titled the talk that way is uh, because it's a vast field. And I wanted to tell you about the stuff that uh, we're kind of interested in, not necessarily the stuff that we're actively doing. Um, so, so what this talk is about, um, or maybe before I, 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 I first, let me, let me also mention that I just have 18 transparencies, and I did it on purpose uh, because I wanted to make it a bit more interactive, interacting. So um, if you have questions or comments, like just uh, go ahead and, 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 and say what you want to say. Um, the structure of the talk is the following. So I'll be talking about uh, three topics that uh, are in principle distinct, but they have uh, some common parts. Uh, I will start by talking about holographic complexity proposals. So complexity equals volume, compl complexity equals action. Uh, they were, uh, to some extent, motivated by uh, the picture of tensor network and the relation of tensor networks to holography, and that will bring me to the tensor network part uh, of my talk. And then, uh, from tensor network part, I will move on to the story of quantum field theory complexity. I think there were um, a few talks on this topic already at this conference, uh, in particular at parallel sessions. And I will conclude there by trying to see what's the, what's the, what's the overlap between these, these three topics. So, so let's start with part one, that is holographic complexity. And I put quotation marks complexity because uh, over here I just mean uh, a story about some particular objects defined in the bulk. And I leave sort of their physical uh, interpretation a bit ambiguous. <laughs> so um, this, the starting point for, for, for whatever I had to say and uh, also to, 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 to many other talks at this, at this meeting uh, is the story of an overlap between quantum information science and condensed matter physics that was sort of um, carried over to high energy, high energy physics theory. Uh, and the, the central player uh, in this game is the notion of entanglement, in particular entanglement entropy. So entanglement uh, is a key notion uh, in uh, quantum many-body uh, physics. Uh, and what I mean by, by entanglement uh, throughout my talk is very simple. So we, st we pick some bases and we consider uh, a multi-partite, we consider a multi-partite quantum mechanical system, suppose two spins, two qubits, and uh, we pick a basis, and uh, basically this state is a product state, I mean it's a state in which, um, in which these, two, these, two, uh, these two subsystems are completely independent from each other, like one doesn't know about the existence of the other, and uh, this is an entangled state, so this is a state in which in a basis of like first qubit, second qubit, uh, is, is, is in, the, these two qubits are entangled. The, the measurements in one are, are um, sorry, this, this state is entanglement, and in order to, to get from one to the other, you can apply a unitary transformation that, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna affect uh, both parties. So what I want to stress is that this notion of entanglement is very much basis dependent, and you can alter it by acting with unitary transformations that affect both parties. But if you act with a unitary transformation that affects only one party, so for example, you want to flip the first spin, so from pointing upwards to pointing downwards, uh, and, and this one the, the other way around, then you're not gonna uh, change uh, entanglement. The entanglement uh, is gonna be the same. So there's a powerful way to quantify it. So instead of asking a question, can you write a given multipartite uh, quantum mechanical state uh, as a product state or not, uh, equivalently, uh, one can answer this question by computing uh, the reduced density matrix over uh, one of the subsystems. So suppose like, the, like so, so we trace out the, the, second, the second qubit. This gives us the reduced density matrix that carries all the information about measurements on the first qubit. And then if you calculate the phenomenon entropy of, of, of this guy, if it's non-zero, then this state is entangled. If it's zero, then it's a product state. 
And of course, as, as I said before, if we add with a unitary that, that affects both parties, so B and B bar, uh, the effect of this unitary might affect uh, the, the form of the entanglement entropy. In particular, it might bring a state from, from an entangled state to a product state. So why I'm rambling about this? So, so I'm rambling about this because of tensor networks, but in the context of holography, uh, this story uh, materialized in a, in, a, in a beautiful structure uh, that is the Rita Kanagi, uh, the Rita Kanagi relation, uh, which is that if we take a holographic space-time, we pick a time slice on the boundary that uh, defines a state. So, 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 so this, this, this Cauchy slice on the boundary defines uh, a state, like entangled state in general. Um, if we pick a subregion on this constant time slice, so this is our B, so you can think of this as a first spin. Of course, this is just a pictorial picture. And we calculate the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix over this guy, then it turns out, and this is precisely the story of Ryu and Takayanagi and, and all the followers, including HRT, that the, the, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the extremal, in this case, minimal, co dimension two bulk surface anchored at the boundary, at the boundary of the, of the region that we're interested in, computes the von Neumann entropy of this reduced density matrix, and for pure states, it computes the entanglement, just the entanglement entropy. Um, so this is something that, 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 that uh, is taken as, as, a, as a super uh, kosher story. I mean, it's understood to a large extent. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of material to back it up. In fact, like when it was devised, there was already uh, a lot of progress made uh, on trying to understand entanglement entropy in quantum field theory. Uh, so, so even when it surfaced, like it's, it was probably not regarded as something super controversial. And in particular, like the last thing that I want to stress is that one argument that you can give for uh, the Ryuta Kanagi conjecture is by comparing the result of this calculation with the result of calculation in other quantum field theories, for example, for free bosons or free fermions. And what you're going to find out is that if you look at uh, dimensions higher than 1 plus 1, the entanglement entropy is going to, I mean, it's going to be always divergent, but uh, in dimension bigger than 1 plus 1, it's going to diverge as an area of the, of the boundary of the region that we're interested in measured in the units of the, of the UV cutoff. And one argument for the correctness of the story can be drawn from the fact that calculations in, in free theory that we sort of trust uh, reproduce a similar structure of divergences than as you observe in, uh, in the Rita Kanagi uh, proposal. And that's going to be uh, relevant for whatever I have to say next in the context of uh, complexity. So, so now we move on to something that is much uh, less uh, well understood. Um, and this is the story of, of, of maximum volume slice. So uh, if you forget about entanglement entropy uh, interpretation, uh, Rita Kanagi surfaces are nothing else than uh, just some geometrical objects defined in, uh, in the bulk of ADS, covariantly in terms of the boundary data. And by boundary data, I mean uh, pr uh, prescribing what's the time slice on the boundary, right? And on this time slice, what the subregion we're interested in, right? When we, once we specify these uh, two things, then everything follows. That is, we look for all possible bulk uh, co-dimension two surfaces anchored on this, on, this, on, this, on this boundary region. And then from, from all these ones, we pick the one that is minimal, right? So like this is a very covariant prescription, very natural one. And then... You can ask a question, are there other similarly defined objects uh, in the bulk of holographic spacetimes, in the bulk of ADS, or spacetimes that are asymptotically ADS or asymptotically locally ADS? And it turns out that the answer is true. And you can do many things. Um, in particular, one thing that you can do is uh, you can pick, a, again, a time slice on the boundary of, of, of your spacetime. So for example, for empty ADS that I depicted here, uh, it's going to be you know, like just, just this circle. And then on the circle, you can anchor uh, co-dimension one. So Rita Kanagi were co-dimension two. Now you anchor co-dimension one surfaces. And you want to come up with a definition of a co-dimension uh, one surface that's going to be covariant. And the way to, to, to go ahead is to define such a surface by imposing a condition that you're going to be looking for a surface of a maximum, maximal volume. And the reason why you're looking for a surface of a maximum volume is that the direction that is uh, transversal to the surface is time-like direction. So if you start moving in this direction, uh, you're able to decrease the volume. So for 
for empty EDS standard coordinates, the surface of a maximum volume is going to be just like a regular constant time slice. So to the best of my knowledge, such considerations appear for the first time uh, in these papers in a slightly more complicated space time that is the, the black hole geometry. Um, and um, you can ask a question, do we need that? And uh, my, my take on this question is the following. Uh, we need it if these co-dimension one surfaces, like this, are independent from Rita Kanagi surfaces. Because if they are sort of not independent, then they are, you can regard them as redundant. But it's a well-appreciated fact uh, that uh, whereas for uh, empty ADS, you can basically, um, through, through any point in empty ADS, there's going to be infinitely many Ryuta Kanagi surfaces passing, and in some way, uh, this gives you a, a hold on like the whole geometry of the bulk in empty ADS, and you can use it to your advantage to reproduce the, the local line element. This goes under the name of holography and later kinematic space. It's well known that in more complicated geometries, in particular um, in a geometry of, um, say, a neutron star or some sort of a star in, in, in the bulk of ADS, there's gonna, for, for stars that are sufficiently dense, there's going to be uh, regions inside the interior of a star that's not going to be penetrated by any Ryuta Kanagi surfaces. But on the other hand, if you look at um, maximum volume slices, these maximum volume slices are going to pass right through the middle of the star. And as a result, they're going to probe part of the bulk that Ryuta Kanagi surfaces do not have access to. Right? So in some sense, there is uh, more stuff in ADS to think about than just Ryuta Kanagi surfaces. Uh, it's not true that uh, it's just co-dimensional volumes. You can get away with other probes. So there are these so-called uh, non-minimal geodesics that go under the name of employment. But for the perspective of the narrative of this talk, I'm, I'm just going to focus on, on these co-dimension one and later co-dimension zero probes. Um, so this story. As I said, uh, this story goes under the names of uh, entanglement is not enough. I mean, this is the slogan taken from, from Saskind uh, that appear in the context of trying to understand the black hole interior, because black hole interior is another example of a geometric region that is not, access, not necessarily accessed fully by Rita Kanagi surfaces. Um, and as I said, like, you, can, you can do something else. You can consider non-extremal co-dimension, uh, sorry, non-minimal co-dimension uh, to uh, bulk probes, entwinement. Or you can take co-dimension one objects as standalone things. So for the perspective of this talk, I'm just going to focus on the second uh, option. Um, so that's not all. I mean, you can ask the other question, is it all? Like, did, did, we exhaust, like, uh, all the, did we exhaust all the material uh, with our time slice? Right? So we, we still have a time slice uh, on the boundary of ADS. And are the maximal volume co-dimension uh, one surfaces uh, the only thing that we can associate with it? And it turns out that that's not really the case. Um, you can do like one more thing. And this one more thing is taking this slice, uh, shoot light rays inward uh, to the futures and inward to the past. And this gives you this, this, this causal diamond. This causal diamond goes under the name of Wheeler the Witt patch. And in this wheeler the width patch that is naturally associated with uh, the, this time slice on the boundary, uh, you can evaluate uh, some quantity. For example, you can evaluate its volume. Uh, but what people did instead is to evaluate uh, the action inside this wheeler the width patch. So this is, I, I want to warn you a bit that this is a very non-standard problem because it's evaluating the, the bulk action on shell. Uh, in a situation in which the, the boundary of the region is not really um, time-like as for Lorentzian ADS or space-like as for Euclidean ADS, but uh, it contains these, these, these null surfaces. And as a result, as compared to the standard lore, uh, what are the boundary terms for gravitational actions that come from the fact that the Ricci uh, tensor is second derivative, you have to supplement it with uh, more terms. In particular, um, you have, to, you have to add such a term that uh, is a term which you integrate over this, this, this null cones that contains an integral over uh, a parameter along the generator of the null cone. And what I, want to, what I want to stress is that this term 
is nice because it cancels the dependence on how we parameterize the generators of the cone. I and mean, we can do this affinely, non-affinely, whatever we want, right? It's, a, it's supposed to be fully covariant. But in order to, to proceed, we have, to, we have a logarithm. And in the logarithm, we have theta. Take, theta basically is how the, how the, how the local uh, surface element uh, changes as, as, as you move along this cone. This theta is dimensionless. And in order to render the whole expression, uh, that, sorry, the theta is dimensionful. And in order to render the full expression dimensionless, you have to multiply it by a dimensionful constant. And this dimensionful constant is arbitrary as far as we can see it. And as a result, the, this action evaluated in this region is, is not unambiguous. It, it depends, in particular, on whatever we plug here. Um, so, so this story continues. Um, so this was a story about constant time slices. And as I was arguing, constant time slice defines a state uh, in quantum field theory and also in holography. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a pure state. Um, now we can ask, what about the mixed state? So, so we, can, we, can, we, can, we can proceed as follows. And that's, that's a prescription that appeared uh, in, in, in these papers uh, two, three years ago. So we again have a time slice. On this time slice, we, we pick a subregion. And this subregion over here is going to be the, basically maybe a, 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 an interval on a circle uh, if it's ADS3. Uh, and this, this subregion defines for us a Rita Kanagi surface. So this is this magenta thing over here. And now what we can look for uh, is a minimal, sorry, a maximum volume uh, slice that is anchored now on two things. So part of the time slice that lies uh, inside the subregion and also the, the Rita Kanagi surface, right? And that's going to be this, this orange thing. And uh, you can ask the question, what this thing now corresponds to? It's, if at all, it's some, some way of assigning uh, a, a number to a reduced density matrix uh, of a, of, of, of a, of a, of a subregion. Uh, so this is uh, a bit in the spirit of volumes. You can also proceed in the spirit of actions. So again, we consider the same uh, subregion on the boundary on a time slice. We have a Ryuta Kanagi surface. With the full time slice, we have associated this Wheeler-DeWitt patch. But with a Ryuta Kanagi surface, we have associated the the, um, uh, the, the, the patch relevant for, for entanglement wedge. And now we can look for the overlap of this. So this is basically this, this red region. And we can evaluate the gravitational action there. And like that's another way of assigning a number, maybe a non-unique number, as, as I was arguing before, uh, to, to this subregion B, to a reduced density matrix in subregion B. And you can, of course, ask the question, what these guys correspond to? And uh, are these interesting objects? Or what is their quantum information theory interpretation, if you are in a quantum information theory spirit? So before, before moving on, uh, let me also stress that uh, these guys uh, have apparently some, some properties. So one property is going to hold always. And this is this property that if, we consider a sub if you consider a time slice and you consider one subregion and a complement, then uh, because it's a max the, 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 the maximum volume of the total anchored on the total slice uh, is going to be always, by definition, bigger or equal to the sums of maximum volumes um, that also pass through the Ryuta Kanagi surface, right? Because over here, we always pick a maximal one no matter what. And over here, we condition on the ones that also pass through the Ryuta Kanagi surfaces. So in, a, in, in this sense, this sum has to be always smaller or equal to to the, to, the total, to the total volume. So this is one robust property. And the other property that was uncovered, although uh, to the best of my knowledge, this is basically based on one check case, uh, for, 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 for the actions evaluated in this in these more complicated geometrical uh, co-dimension zero uh, uh, parts of space-time, uh, the opposite property holds. That is, if you calculate the action for related for this uh, subregion and add to it the action related re relevant for the for the complement the the sum is going to be bigger or equal to the to this expression so 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 so, so there, there there are some distinctive features like there seems to be some distinctive features between these two proposals and uh, the last thing that that I want to I want to uh, stress at this level is that uh, at least over here um, you can use this, this kinematic space uh, technology, holography, to express uh, volumes 
of subregions in terms of Ryutakanagi surfaces. And like that's, that, that's also something that, that one should keep in mind. Um, so, so without providing you the, the physical interpretation of these objects, let me uh, spell out some properties. And later on, what, will be, what, what I will want to discuss is trying to do calculations in free quantum field theories that are capable of reproducing at least some of these properties. So, so let me start with, let me start with MTADS. So if you look at the MTADS and we calculate the maximum volume slice, this maximum volume slice anchored on a time slice on the boundary of ADS is given by the volume, spatial volume occupied by your holographic conformal field theory uh, measured in the units of the UV regulator, so it's divergent. But if you calculate the action, so if you calculate the action evaluated in this wheeler dewitt patch, what you're gonna get is precisely the same sort of an expression, but on top of this, you're gonna get a logarithm, and in this logar under this logarithm, what appears is this ambiguous constant that is re related to the ambiguity in the boundary term that you add along the null boundary. And in particular, if you make this constant uh, proportional to the UV regulator, then what you get is a subleading divergent with respect to the cutoff that is now logarithmic. So this is the story, this is the story of MTEDS. And now let's, let's abstract a bit. So what kind of other interesting pure states for which uh, entanglement was discussed uh, we know in holography? And the answer to it is, of course, this is the thermophile double state. So thermophile double state is a purification of a, of a thermal state, thermal density matrix. Uh, this state in holography is represented by two boundary spacetime. That is a maximal extension of the ads Rothschild spacetime. So we have now two boundaries. On each of these boundaries, we have a time slice on the left and on the right. And now we can calculate uh, maximum volume uh, slices or wheeler the width uh, patch actions uh, that are anchored sort of on both boundaries. And now there are two interesting properties that were uncovered in the literature. So one property is that if we look at, say, t equals zero slice on, on both boundaries, which is here, then uh, the result of this calculation after we subtract from it the result of the calculation in two vacua, so this is sort of, um, this, this is called like a formation, uh, is gonna be proportional to the thermal entropy. And the second the more profound uh, property is that if we do a calculation in which we vary the position of time slices on both boundaries, it turns out that if we push these times forward, I mean upwards in, on, on both boundaries, it turns out that this quantity at least at late times exhibits linear growth. So, so these, are, these, are, these are some characteristic features of, 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 of these two objects. And of course the question is, uh, what is their uh, holographic dual? So what we know for sure is that these objects are distinct from Rutakanagi surfaces because of the story of entanglement shadows of the regions not probed by Rutakanagi in generic space times, and also because Rutakanagi surfaces saturate in ADS fractal background. And uh, so far, there is basically no uh, argument that is widely accepted that is based on the holographic dictionary that provides an interpretation to these objects. And what I will try to pursue in my talk. Uh, is an interpretation in terms of a complexity in holographic quantum field theories. And I want to get there through a link with tensor networks. So uh, before I move on to tensor network part of my story, I want to ask if you have any questions or, or comments about what I said so far. And drink water. So if there is nothing, let me move on. So, um, so tensor networks is, uh, is a beautiful uh, machinery from the intersection of quantum information science and uh, condensed matter physics. And, and uh, the starting point to, to, one starting point to introduce them is that if you consider uh, quantum many body Hilbert space uh, for n parties, so for example, for n qubits, then it turns out that the dimension of the Hilbert space grows exponentially with the number of of, of, of your, of your uh, individual components or individual building blocks of your system. And as a result, 
if you want to understand such uh, systems using standard methods, say um, exact diagonalization, you're not going to be able to do this unless you focus on really small systems with n of the order of 10, 20, maybe 30. And tensor networks is, uh, is an idea that, or are a set of ideas that were born as variational ansatzes that are not capable of, understand, of providing understanding of any state in this vast uh, Hilbert space but in fact are capable of providing insights about subset of all states, that is a tiny subset, I mean like basically a, a little corner in Hilbert space that is relevant for ground states of local Hamiltonians and uh, low-lying excitations of, of them. So uh, the, the underlying idea is that the ground state of local Hamiltonian with an exception of critical systems in one plus one dimension uh, is locally entangled. So if we calculate the entanglement entropy over number of sites, at some point when we start growing number of sites, the entanglement entropy is gonna remain constant. It's not gonna, it's not gonna increase. So this is basically the story, of, the story of, the, of the ARIA law in one plus one dimension. And the ARIA in one plus one dimension uh, is gonna be two points, right? And the ARIA of two points is, is, is just some number. And like as you increase uh, the distance between these two points, this number is not gonna change. And as a result, uh, in one plus one dimension, one can construct uh, an un variational ansatz that have this feature that is entanglement that is constant as you increase the distance uh, or, or the size of the subsystem uh, that allows you to capture uh, ground states of, of, of models that have a finite correlation length. Um, and, 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 and basically the, the picture is as follows. So, so we have uh, indices that are physical. So suppose we have five qubits, right? The f first qubit, second qubit, and so on, up to the fifth qubit, right? And now we look for, for, for the wave function uh, for this five qubit system that is not a sum of, you know, like arbitrary um, basis elements in this five qubit states because uh, there are many terms. And if we extrapolate, if we go to larger, larger value, number of qubits, it's going to become more and more unmanageable. But instead, we write an we write an ansatz that basically is a product of matrices uh, between various sites. And for example, so each of these, so each of these nodes here, properties of entanglement between uh, various subsystems. And if you were to calculate the component of the wave function, so something that I advise you not to start with, what you would be supposed to do is to take this, this product of matrices with open indices and contract open indices with a given uh, basis element. So for example, if you want to understand what's the contract tensors, uh, it's, it's called tensor network. But now the beauty of this ansatz is that precisely it, um, it captures the, the physics relevant for you. So, so what you can do is you can, you can consider a, a subsystem in which you look at three sites in the middle. And now the state over five uh, sites, you can, you, can, you can express as a sum over states that are confined to three sides and to the remaining two sides. And it turns out that when you sum over these states that are confined to two, two sides and to the, to the two sides and three sides, then this sum, because this index over here runs over a finite number of values, chi, chi values, this sum overruns only to, to, to chi squared. And as a result, if you calculate entanglement entropy for the subregion B with respect to tracing out the, the B bar, it turns out that the entanglement entropy is going to be bounded by logs of, log of chi squared. So keeping chi constant, I mean, allows us to, to calculate entanglement over larger and larger distances uh, large enough. And of course, the key feature of this is that this is a variational ansatz. So if this is just a beautiful story that you can represent in some sense geometrically, it's not that interesting from the point of view of actual calculation, unless you can really efficiently contract uh, such tensors, so for example, perform such an operation, and at the same time, uh, not only uh, understand the structure of a tensor network, but also provide what sit the meat, so what's sitting in individual tensors. And what sits in individual tensors comes from energy minimalization. And for, for such a tensor network called matrix product state, you can, you can for, for moderate values of, I mean, for not too large, what you can do is you can efficiently contract it and efficiently uh, minimize uh, energy. So this is a, this is a very nice story. Uh, this is a, also a very large story. Uh, 
And what seems to be more relevant for holography in this context uh, is another uh, version of an ansatz that uh, circumnavigates the problem uh, related to criticality in one plus one dimension. Because we know that if we calculate entanglement entropy in one plus one dimension, it's, it does not remain constant if you look at, uh, at, at large distances for critical systems. But in fact, what it does, it grows logarithmically with the, with the subsystem size. This, this was something that was discovered uh, a long time ago by, uh, by people including uh, one person in the audience and later uh, considered again by uh, Cardi and Calabresa and many other authors. And the question is, can one construct a tensor network? Can one construct an ansatz that uh, sort of geometrizes this logarithmic growth of the entanglement with the subsystem size? And the story is that this is true. I mean, this holds. And this goes under the name of multi-scale entanglement normalization ansatz. So, so MERA, for short, is a tensor network that captures ground states of critical systems in one plus one dimension. And you can view it uh, in two equivalent ways. So one way uh, to view MERA is as a coarse graining operation. And the whole idea is that now that uh, this is the tensor network that uh, is composed of uh, two kinds of elementary object. So the first elementary object is a unitary operator that in this picture just acts on two sides. So one spin, the other spin, and uh, it produces like uh, the, 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 the state on these two sides that is altered by a unitary transformation. And the second object is the isometric tensor. So this is this three-leg tensor that what it does, if it acts on two spins, two qubits, it produces one qubit uh, after, after, uh, after operating on them. And as a result, what it allows you to do is to, to, to spin block, say, two spins into one spin. But the, the beauty of this ansatz is that it doesn't do this in a, in, a, in a trivial way. That is, we have like n spins. We spin block them, we produce n half. We spin block these, these n half, we produce n fourth, and so on and so forth. It's more clever. And the, the reason why it's more clever is that it applies these unitary transformations. And if there is a... If there is an entanglement between this spin, so, so let me start at the, let me start over here, because it's going to be simpler. If there is an entanglement between this guy and that guy, what it does in the wave function, it removes this entanglement through action of the unitary. And as I said, entanglement in multi-party system can be got rid of by a unitary transformation, right? So this is precisely what we do. We do this, we do the same on the right-hand side, that is, we remove entanglement between this side and that side. And now, there, there is no entanglement between this and that part of the, the no short range entanglement between that and that part. And what we do is we can get rid of these two spins and map them together to one. And in this reason, we, in this way, we didn't lose uh, any entanglement. I mean, we first got rid of the entanglement and then w after disentangling these, these sites, we map them to, to, to a one. So like this is, what, this is the way how it works. Um, and the beauty of it is that, as a result of it, it, it builds a more complicated geometrical structure. So instead of like a one-dimensional string, you have like something that looks more like a hyperbolic disk, obviously. And uh, as I was arguing here, sort of the entanglement is bounded by the minimal cut. And over here, like the minimal cut over the tensor network is, is constant. It doesn't depend on the size of the subsystem that you consider. Whereas here for, for, for Mera, the minimal cut scales logarithmically with the size of the subsystem. And as a result, it's, it's in principle capable of reproducing this logarithmic growth of entanglement with the subsystem size in one plus one dimensional conformal field theories. So, so this is the story of, of MERA as a, as a variational ansatz. Uh, you can run this story the other way. So over here, I talked about coarse graining transformation. Uh, you can also think of MERA as sort of an entangling ansatz. So the idea is that uh, each of these triangular tensors, you can view as a, as a as a square tensor, but this square tensor has one of the indices uh, contracted with some dummy state, say spin up for, for, for definiteness. And as a result, you can view this whole structure as a repetitive uh, application of unitary transformations acting on a state that in the end is a spatially unentangled state. So you can think of Mera as something that starts with a state that does not have any entanglement over whatever the, the length scale, and gradually producing the, the state that has entanglement over shorter and shorter scales after we finish at whatever our cutoff is. And of course, the, the link with uh, these holographic complexity proposals comes about from the fact that 
you can calculate the number of tensors in MERA, and if you associate uh, MERA with the constant time slice of ADS, then sort of the volume of constant time slice of ADS would become the, the sort of related to the number of unitaries that, that, that's hit here, right? And then with this link to unitary circuits, you can, you can ask a question like, what's the interpret if, if this link is correct whatsoever, but that's the first question, then you can ask a question like, is there, is there interpretation of volumes in ADS or these actions in ADS, because the results are not too distinct between these two, uh, in terms of unitary circuits? And like, that's the, the last part of my story. Um, but before I move there, uh, in the remaining uh, 15 minutes or so, what I want to stress uh, a bit is that till now, uh, till this slide, uh, not till now in time, MERA and, um, and MPS, matrix product states, were uh, nothing else than variational ansatzes. That is, uh, they were postulated based on the properties of entanglement in quantum many body state that uh, we expect or we know that should hold. And then we were taking, a, say, a Hamiltonian or spin chain, so say critical Ising or whatever you want, contracting these tensor networks efficiently on a computer and minimizing the energy. And in this way, I mean, including like all sorts of clever ideas to, that come into this to do this uh, in a reasonable time, we're able to provide the answers for the full wave function, right? Like this is, the, this is the picture. But now the question is, can one do better? Can one sort of understand tensor networks as a, as a part that follows from more fundamental principles? And the answer is yes. And this is a part of developments that, uh, start, that kicked out uh, around four years ago. And the idea is that uh, one way to think about the ground state is to take a Euclidean path integral, right? Euclidean path integral de defines ground states in any uh, quantum mechanical system. And now what you can try to do is you can coarse grain this Euclidean path integral. So, I mean, I'm gonna be a bit brief, uh, but, but I just want to give you the general idea. So, so, so we can view the, the Euclidean path integral as, as a tensor network. I mean, that's something that is standard for tensor networkers. But now it's a special kind of a tensor network that has one boundary open. I mean, it's important to keep in mind that it has one boundary open. Similarly to MPS having one boundary open or MERA having one boundary open, right? The physical indices. And now what you can do is having a tensor network, you can cleverly uh, spin block it. I mean, by spin blocking, I mean you can arrange different tensors together. So for example, you can sort of spiritually, although that's not really what's happening, you can map four block of four tensors into a new tensor, right? And then block of four blocks of four tensors into a new tensor and so on and so forth until you basically coarse grain your system completely. Uh, and that would be the picture if you were considering the, the partition function. But now, because uh, we are interested in a state and state has open indices, this coarse graining cannot proceed indefinitely because we want to keep the the open legs fixed. I mean, open legs are physical. Open legs are the stuff that we really contract with the Hamiltonian, for example. And because of this requirement, whenever we coarse grain our tensors and we replace them by, by, by coarser tensors, there's gonna be a leftover. And this leftover is some transitional layer between the, op say, open indices and the rest. And this transitional layer turns out to be composed of disentanglers and isometries and it turns out to be nothing else than a layer of MERA. And this is a picture that, in which the so-called tensor network normalization, so blocking tensors, produces MERA. And you can ask a question, how to think about it geometrically, right? So, so now we want to think about it geometrically, not necessarily in the context of ads -CFT, just in the context of, of, of field theory or, or a spin system. And when you think about this, this tensor network, you can think of it as Euclidean time evolution on a flat Euclidean manifold, right? So, so, so we evolve with a, with a Hamiltonian in Euclidean time, right? And as you go from one slice to the other, the, this, we, we don't introduce any curvature. But we can do something else, and we can, we can sort of uh, delete. And in this way, we can get from a slice, from a slice of some length to a slice of a different length, right? And so on and so forth, right? And it, it turns out that, uh, indeed, this, is, this seems to be a right way of uh, thinking about this construction. And in one plus one dimension, in critical systems, uh, whatever background geometry we consider, we can think of it as a conformal transformation acting on a, on a flat Euclidean metric. And this conformal transformation is gonna be specified by this, by this warp factor phi. 
And now, if you think about you know this transitioning from one layer to the other and changing you know like the changing the the geometry of the underlying path integral, uh, then you might think that you know when when phi uh, when phi remem remains constant, the only thing that you do is you add these these tensors that correspond to Euclidean time evolution, maybe the ones uh, after a few coarse graining. Or not, but the only thing that you do, you just you know apply layers of Euclidean time evolution. However, if you if you change the the length of your Euclidean time slice, right, that requires uh, introducing a layer of Mera, right? Because I just said that if you want to coarse grain your tensors, you have to introduce a layer of Mera, right? So so basically, whenever there is a layer of Mera, that means that this phi here has a non-trivial derivative, and if you want to calculate the total number of tensors. Tensors, the thing that you should presumably integrate is e to the 2 phi. So, so basically the volume, the volume of this space after the conformal transformation. So this is something that, that is very much based on the picture of tensor networks. And you might worry that, I mean, this is not typically the, the way high energy physicists uh, deal with quantum field theories, right? So the question is, can one sort of take it and adapt it uh, to the picture of, most standard picture of the way of dealing with quantum field theories. And, and there's been progress in this direction. I mean, it's not a complete problem. There's been progress in this direction. And this progress goes under the name of integral optimization or optimization. So, so now we work in continuum. I mean, we have to introduce some UV regulator, but we are in a continuum quantum field theory in principle. Uh, we consider Euclidean path integral on a, on a flat uh, space. And this defines for us the vacuum wave functional. And now what you can do is you can we can perform a conformal transformation on this Euclidean uh, manifold. But of course, we want to keep this, this boundary fixed, right? Because this is the boundary where the physical indices are. This is the boundary where we define our physical states. And it turns out that if you deal with conformal field theories, a beautiful thing happens. That is, this wave functional after such a transformation uh, changes but it changes in a very simple way. I mean, it picks just like an overall normalization. And of course, the overall normalization is not something that changes physics. I mean, you can always uh, bring, like, get rid of it. But the beauty of it is that this, this, this overall factor that is an exponent of the Liouville action is, has, a, has a very suggestive structure that uh, would be very interesting to understand in more details. That is, it contains a derivative of the conformal factor and the integral over the volume. And when you look at these two terms and compare with the picture here, one thing that you might want to conjecture is that this derivative over here acts some, somehow the number of um, isometries and disentanglers in continuum quantum field theory. And this guy over here uh, counts uh, the number of um, overall number of tensors in continuum quantum field theory, whatever this means. And now what you can do, I mean, like, uh, th this factor is sort of irrelevant for whatever is the form of your wave function because it's a normalization. But what you can do is you can minimize it. And this minimization leads for you uh, uh, basically to the H2. I mean, the solution to the minimization problem in which you vary this action with respect to phi leads to H2. And uh, this H2 in this picture would correspond to a situation in which we have a layer of Mera and then instead of a layer of coarse grain time evolution, we just have another layer of Mera, and another layer of Mera, and another layer of Mera. So in this story, if it's correct, one can sort of try to say that Mera is, a optimal, is an optimal state preparation from the point of view of Euclidean path integrals and this path integral optimization. So, I mean, I don't have real time to talk about it, so let me mention it. And I want to mention it because it's not, I, I don't think it's widely known, but it's a very beautiful uh, paper that I think does not require any uh, tensor network background uh, because it operates with free field theories in a standard language in which this MERA has, be, has been generalized or proposed. There was a proposed generalization to continuum uh, for free CFTs. And recently, I want to highlight that there was a paper, uh, a series of two papers, in fact, that uh, try to understand how to improve on this framework, build on this framework to, to consider the case of interacting quantum field theories. So any questions about tensor networks? Yeah. So 
So this is a very basic question with something I was wondering about. If you go back to the MPS and the mirror, I mean, to really make clear what the difference is between the two. So, um, so why is it called matrix product state? Because it's not really, I mean, you were claiming that these horizontal links really lead to an entanglement. Okay, so, so then it's not a product anymore. I was confused. Oh, it's a, name. The, the reason why it's called matrix product state is that yeah. each of these tensors you can regard as mat matrices. Yeah. It has like three indices. Yeah. And in order to get the state, uh, what you have to do is to, you have to contract uh, two indices of these matrices, one with a matrix before and the other one with the matrix after. Okay, but then it's not a product state, it's an entangled state. Uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, if <laughs> matrices are C numbers, yeah. then it becomes a product state. So yeah. it's like a sort of like the next leading order thing uh, okay. compared to the product state. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh. I don't know, maybe to channel a question. Uh, are you aware of these, uh, of this construction called quantum renormalization group by Sinsik Lee? Now I was wondering, I listen to you, right? I wonder whether there's some kind of relation that's as if it's a kind of an other representation of the same thing. Is there any clarity? I'm, I'm, I'm aware of this, uh, but I don't have like anything clever to say. Yeah. But I think, uh, I mean, perhaps now, given this tensor network optimization, uh, tensor network normalization and path integral optimization, it's a good time to try to, to, to start think, think about, yeah, about it, right? It's like okay. Schrodinger first Heisenberg of a state or something. So I, I also have a general question. What's the role of uh, a large number of degrees of freedom in these constructions? I mean, all holographic examples we know of as large n in some way or the other. Okay, that's, that's an excellent question. So over here, this is a general structure. Um, over here, uh, the, the argument here is completely general. It's valid for any central charge. But when it comes to the actual tensor network constructions, uh, I mean, you can, you can write a tensor network uh, in general, but uh, there, the, the underlying picture is that this story uh, is, an, in fact, a numerical story. And in order to do these calculations numerically, you have to restrict yourself to reasonable bond dimension. And uh, what, what, what is meant by a reasonable bond dimension depends on what kind of tensor network you consider, right? So for MPS, apparently, you can take like it to be, to, to, to be reasonably large. For MERA, because the, the network is more complicated, I think you have to take, take a smaller one. And, but of course, uh, if, you, if you look at this, uh, the entanglement entropy is proportional to the, to the logarithm of chi here. And over here, it's also gonna, there's also going to be a logarithm of chi. So if you take a large central charge limit, that means that your bond dimension should explode exponentially with the central charge, right? So from the point of view of, of the, doing numerics, that's a very bad thing. But then you can start thinking more creatively, and I think nobody really did this in a controllable way. And you can maybe start thinking, can you replace these tensors by some sort of like random tensors that would nevertheless provide an accurate representation of the ground state? And like maybe this is the way to go. Maybe not all the features I, I of the tensor. I guess what I was asking is that if I start with a field theory with a very small number of degrees of freedom, I can do this construction. But then I would sort of expect that uh, what I get in a single time slice in, in this MIRA uh, procedure is something very bad. I mean, it's not no geometry there, right? Of, of course, of course. I mean, the, the way I'm, I'm trying to present it, and sorry if I if I didn't did, if I didn't do this in a in a totally manifest way, uh, is that it's not clear what's the gravity dual to a tensor network. Uh, it's not even clear if a tensor network has a natural gravity dual, and I think it's a very important question that our community should try to address to the best of our 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 means. Uh, the only thing that we know for sure is that there is a structural similarity between Mera and a slice of ADS or a slice of uh, or, or at the Sitter space time, and the question is what to do with it. And I think we are still at this level. So, so in the remaining uh, several minutes, uh, let me just uh, discuss another take on this story. Uh, and I'm going to be very brief uh, because uh, you heard about it in, or some of you heard about it in parallel talks. And this is the story of, holo of complexity. So I was arguing this maximal volume slice and action in Willard DeWitt patch as holographic complexity proposals with complexity in quotation marks. Um, so, so this is still the status, I think. Um, but uh, there, there has been a link proposed with, with, with the notion of, of complexity that is a minimal number of elementary unitary operations that are needed to prepare a given state, say a vacuum for the case of uh, empty ADS or a thermophile double state for the case of ADS Rothschild black hole, starting from a reference state. And it's like, it's a story that uh, is only developing now. 
Uh, and I, I love to have more time to talk about it, but I, I will have to cut it a bit short. What I want to stress is that basically pure 2017, uh, I mean, a lot of things were, know, were known about entanglement entropy in a quantum field theory, but nothing about complexity. So uh, we want to make progress, and I want to highlight a few works that deal with uh, this object with complexity using Gaussian states in free quantum field theory. So um, the, the, the idea for, for this program or the chances of success for this program are similar to sort of trying to understand the physics of Rita Kanagi having access only to free theories. And the only thing that we can hope for then is uh, universality in the results. That is, if we calculate entanglement entropy for a free quantum field theory, we're gonna get like a ARIA term, right? If we calculate it for holographic quantum field theories using Rita Kanagi, we're also gonna get an ARIA term, right? So, so, so in this, this, is the, this is the way we want to try to make progress. That is, we want to try to do calculations in, in free field theories, which are fully controllable calculations and compare results with holography and try to see if this works or maybe it doesn't, right? So what we're gonna be doing is to, to work with Gaussian states. Uh, you can ask the question, what kind of gates we consider? And Rod Jefferson, uh, who's standing there uh, in the heat, uh, already told you something about it. We're gonna be doing the, the, the symplectic transformations, so the most general uh, unitary transformations that map one Gaussian state to the other Gaussian state. Uh, and we assume that all one-point expectation values are are vanishing. And after the dust settles, it's, it's, it's quite complicated, in fact, despite appearances. Uh, what, you can, what you can get for the vacuum of a, of a free quantum field theory is something that looks very close to the prediction of the holographic uh, complexity calculation. So, so there, is a, there is a tick that uh, you should put there. The, what is perhaps surprising, and I want to highlight, uh, is that the state that you have to take then in order to get a nice agreement with holography is a spatially disentangled state. So it's a state that uh, formally, from the point of view of your quantum field theory, does not belong to the same uh, Hilbert space. Uh, you can uh, do a similar calculation for the thermofield double state. And it turns out that if you don't look at time dependence in thermofield double states, you can also reproduce to a reasonable amount uh, the properties of, of complexity obtained by looking, holographic complexity obtained by looking at the thermofield double uh, geometries. Uh, however, if you look at time dependence, uh, what you get is that the complexity as defined by uh, free uh, uh, quantum field theory at some point saturates, actually really quickly saturates over a time of the order of beta, inverse of the temperature, whereas the holographic complexity proposals predict this universal linear growth. And what I want to stress here is that uh, that's something to be expected. I mean, we know for a long time that uh, free theories are really bad at capturing time dependence of strongly coupled cousins. A uh, prime example of this is eta over s. Eta over s is 1 over 4 pi for in supergravity. In uh, weakly coupled theories, it uh, diverges as the coupling constant is lower to zero, right? So, so these, these things are really different. And last but not least, uh, I want to uh, point out like, that there's a significant difference between entanglement and complexity already in three models. So I was arguing that the maximum volume proposals are not really fully reproducible using, using Ruta Kanagis, right, because of the story of entanglement shadows. So in this little paper that appeared uh, a week ago or so, uh, we look at the simple toy model of this. So we looked at uh, two harmonic oscillators. So two harmonic oscillators because you want to have a subsystem and the subsystem is gonna be one harmonic oscillator. Uh, so this is the, the covariance matrix, so matrix of uh, correlations in this two harmonic oscillator uh, setup. And uh, basically in Gaussian states, if you provide all the Gaussian, so quadratic expectation values for, for one system, for one first harmonic oscillator, then that means that you know the full density matrix. So entanglement entropy is just sensitive to that part of the correlations or that part of correlations. But uh, if you calculate complexity, complexity is going to be sensitive to all correlations. So also correlations that are completely not captured or not, not felt uh, by, by entanglement entropy. And uh, the last thing that I want to point out is that uh, there is a, by, by looking at this toy example, and this is what we did, we, we explored in this paper, uh, you can also try to define complexity for subregions using you know, bona fide complexity calculations in free setups. And the way to do this is to fix uh, a density matrix, reduced density matrix for one subsystem, and then consider all purifications that are consistent with this reduced density matrix, and then calculate complexities for every state in this purification, and minimize with respect to the remaining parameters. And this way you, you associate a uniquely 
a value of complexity for a reduced density matrix. I mean, there, it, it's a developing story. It's probably the, the first uh, calculation of that kind uh, in complexity. But what's interesting is that scanning uh, many examples, I think like we had like 70,000 examples or, yeah. yeah. Uh, what we find out is that in this simple setup, uh, in some restricted class of uh, definitions of complexity, I mean, it's not fully general, uh, we found that if we calculate the complexity for this reduced density matrix plus the complexity for that reduced density matrix and then compare it with the complexity for the full state, this sum is always bigger than the, 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 the value of full complexity. So it's a, it's a bit against the, the volume proposal if you were to really take it uh, seriously. So, so with this, I, I want to finish. Um, and uh, I'm just going to display this slide and maybe take a question or two. Thank you. So uh, maybe two uh, slightly related questions. So in the case of entanglement entropy, um, there's some understanding of the one loop, I mean of the one over C corrections. Maybe this related to Sumit's question. Um, like say for example, the FLM term or so on. Uh, is there any proposal for a complexity in this direction or it's too early to say? Because in, in the case of the first example that you showed, uh, the one in pure ADS, right, the calculation of the maximum volume slice, then you, of course you get a constant, right? I mean, th this volume is not growing in time, therefore the complexity is a constant, but that's fine because this is a pure, this is a pure state, right? I mean, this is, a, this is an eigenstate yeah. of the Hamiltonian. But I would guess that the one loop corrections in the box should change that. Uh, so if you include one loop correction to empty EDS, it would still be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. It's just that, like, you're Fine. If you put a conical defect, and then you, you could correct that. I think so is there any proposal? Um, you know, I, I'm not really aware of such studies. If I were to you know, like, uh, put some fantasy here, I, you, know, like you can maybe calculate quantum fluctuations, include their bigger action, still calculate the volume. But like, that's, of course, like something that is super you know, like down to earth and maybe stupid even down to its roots. I think like more progress was made not for proper quantum corrections, but for alpha prime corrections, that is for higher curvature corrections. And there's been some results in the context of complexity equals action there. Okay. But, uh, okay. I mean, I, I think the, the, the question that you raised has not been really addressed to, today. All right, other questions, please? If not, uh, we proceed to the next talk. Um, I apologize again for the uh, missing color channel. We notified our technicians to solve the problem. Next speaker is uh, Carmen. So, uh, oh yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Next speaker is Marie Carmen um, Reynolds from Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. And she will tell us something about the use of tensor networks in lattice gauge theory. <laughs> 